Good morning, New York. Good afternoon, Amsterdam. And uh, whatever time of day it is, uh, whenever you're watching and wherever you're watching, we're here with uh, Pam Parker Sensei. She's teaching Aido, and Natalie will be uh, introducing her in a second. We are talking today about Ki Kentai Ichi in Aido and probably in life. Uh, just before we start, I would like to say that we are live, and for those who watch us live, you're welcome to, to ask your questions. We will try to answer them directly. And if you're watching later, we would be happy to read your questions after and also answer them after this session. So let's go. Perfect. So there is nothing like, there are no words to introduce Parker Sensei because she's wonderful. She's my sensei. And this is not me being biased. She's probably one of the most iconic uh, Yaido senseis in the world. So Parker Sensei, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me and for setting this up. I'm really happy to take part. Perfect. So I would love to start with what is Yaido because a lot of people are not that familiar with it. And a little bit, how do you see it as a Buddha? Mm, hi. Okay. So... Iaido is the art of drawing the sword. That's a short description. In the, today's world, uh, in the All Japan Kendo Federation, it is one of three arts, the other two being Kendo and Jodo. Um, there's uh, other international organizations, such as the All Japan Iaido um, Federation, which is EI only, as far as I know. Um, and in All Japan Kendo Federation with three arts, in Kendo we have, we wear armor, we use a bamboo sword and we have real opponents. And there are those senseis in the world. Right. And um, in, in Jodo, Kendo. we use wooden weapons and we have real opponents. But in EI, we use real swords, but we don't have a real opponent. Our opponent is always imagined. So we have, we wear armor. So we have to, we build up our ability to imagine properly so we can actually make sense of what we're doing. And then when we make sense of it, hopefully someone watching you can also make sense of it. The short version of that is I have to see my opponent. And when I do it properly, you watching me can see my opponent also. You can see the necessity of what I'm doing. That is a great description. I also love in the eye where we say the opponent is ourselves. It's just always better than we are. So we always improve. Which indeed, it's indeed. Right. Yeah. You don't you don't have to imagine somebody bigger and faster and stronger and younger and smarter than you. But somebody kind of like you only a little bit more so that you have to, you know, you have to, as you say, you have to improve in order to uh, overcome them. And then you, you know, pump them up a little bit more and you are able to overcome even more. Okay. All right. And, and thank you also for being very patient because yeah, is also very, like for me, it was very difficult and for most people it's very different. So, you know, as I said, yeah, it's very, yeah, it's not well known. Even sometimes in Japan, people don't know what it is. They almost everybody, if you say Kendo, almost everybody says, Oh, right. Kendo. And they, they have some idea of it, but for the idol and, also Jodo, but we're not talking about that. They're smaller um, and they're less well-known. They, Kendo and Ei come from the same roots of swordsmanship of the samurai class and uh, its dissolution and uh, the transformation of swordsmanship from uh, military and fighting, dueling, all that stuff to something more like modern Budo where we are not attempting to learn how to kill people or even how to defend ourselves, but how to, uh, how to know ourselves, how to become better versions of ourselves, how to actually be, I'm gonna say, a little different in the world than we would be without it. That's great, yeah, yeah. Even in a, we always, we are told in, uh, in, in Aikido, we are always told that, uh, Aikido techniques come all from Kendo. Of course, they're initially they were all done with a sword. And uh, sword. Sometimes, if we don't understand where and how it should work, then then we use a sword to see. Okay, how? Okay, this is, mm -hmm. this is where it comes with. This is the origin. This is the source. Great, great. Mm -hmm. 
But I guess you were speaking about the being, uh, uh, your enemy being invisible. And I guess it takes a lot of concentration to imagine your enemy and to, to stay concentrated on that enemy. And I think this is where Kiken Taiichi comes into. And when you came up with this, uh, with this term, with this notion, with this topic, it, uh, of course, we, it, it talks to me as uh, from the point of view of Buddhism, where we know it as body, speech and mind or body, energy and mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, where body is body, we know mind is mind, is, is, is understandable. And the energy or the speech is a kind of link between the two. Is this, would this translate into how you see Kikan Taiichi? A little bit, but first of all, I didn't come up with this concept. I came up with it as something we could discuss. Yes. <laughs> Kikan Taiichi actually comes from, it comes from Kendo at base. And in Kendo, it, it's a description of the proper striking. You're using good posture, the right part of the sword to strike the correct targets with good spirit. And in Kendo, the, the evidence of the spirit is the Kiai. And because in Aikido and the EI that, that I practice, we don't make Kiai, then we have a little bit of a, hmm, how are we gonna do this? Um, there, there are actually um, modern, you know, there are EI being practiced now in Japan, also I think there's a group in the US where people do Kiai. Mm -hmm. So it's not exclusive, there's, it's not that all uh, uh, classical styles of EI don't Kiai, some do, but all the ones I practice don't Kiai. Um, but there is a silent Kiai, which has to do with uh, you, you know, using the core, which we have to use anyway. Um, and people who practice something where they Kiai can sometimes also get a very distinct feeling of, oh, if I just opened my mouth, there would, there would, be, a, there would be a sound because I'm doing all the parts except the voicing. But the speech or voice, there's, there's, we, we think of it when we teach people, we think of it as uh, how to you know, use the inside of your body to externalize something which is, you know, that's kind of a very general description of almost any movement that has meaning, right? But we do, it's actually very hard to teach people to ki yeah. Um There's a, a way in which many, many people are, are too shy right. um, and, they, and they don't know how to do the mechanics. They don't know how to open the throat. They don't know how to, you know, push from underneath in the belly, all kinds of things like that. So we use some breathing to help people get the, the pushing from underneath part. Um, the opening the throat, you know, that takes time and a certain amount of confidence. When you open anything, you have to have some confidence that it will be um, safe. You won't be like open your mouth and it get filled with, with ocean water, right? Or, you know, poison gas or whatever. You have to have some, some confidence that you can do this safely. And I think there's, you know, we, we mostly have like more like social fears, like people will laugh at me if I do that, or they'll all do it right and I'll do it wrong, or one of those things that we all have. Um, but the, the ki is the expression of something internal. And whether you have a voice or not, it's that internal thing, you wanna cultivate that. That's a kind of, you know, when, you, when there's no ki, it's an unvoiced, close to invisible strength. And it shows itself in some other things maybe, but without the ki, it's, it's not a separate, it's not so easily perceived, I think. Does that make sense? No. Makes total sense. And for me, I, what I love about Kik and Taichi, I feel we're in a society where the mind is somewhere else and the body is and bringing it together, using the sword and the movement to bring them together is really beautiful in the eye. So I wanted to ask you a little bit, like what is the role of the body in the eye? And then we'll go on the role of the mind, but what is really the role of the body and how it evolves in Kik and Tai Chi? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the, in the beginning, uh, somebody beginning EI will tend to focus in front of them on their hands and the sword. 
and they'll just be like so excited and they'll be so afraid that they'll drop it or hurt themselves or hurt somebody else. Their, their entire focus is out here in their hands. Um, over time, people become more confident and more accustomed to the sword. And they're not so, wor not so worried about it flying away or to break it or whatever. And they can then start to focus closer to themselves in, in their body, in their feet, their legs, their core, um, in their chest and shoulders, in the, the neck. You don't, you don't need to focus much above here, actually. Um, it's, uh, you don't want to have too many ideas because in our culture, as you said, your mind is somewhere over here and your body may not be there. So if you're constantly looking to what's in here for what to do, you may have some disconnects that you don't actually want. The, you know, we, 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 well, we want to teach people to where is your opponent, your invisible opponent? How can you interact with them? But we don't want to get like too esoteric or too anything because it separates you in the beginning. When you are more, when, when you are more comfortable with your body, with your breathing, with how your body works, how you can be in your body, then, then you can reach out more without getting lost, without losing the groundedness that you have. Being grounded, you know, where's the floor? Where are my feet on the floor? Where's my feet in relation to my knees and my hips? Where's my breath? Where's my breath sitting? Where's my center? What constitutes my center? You know, sometimes we use core, which in our, in modern American English means something about muscles. Um, and sometimes if we use center, that's a little less purely muscular and a little more like, okay, where are you? Where, where are you? Um, and which for me connects to where are my feet? Where's the floor? You know, how do I, how do I stand or sit on the floor? How is the floor? standing or sitting or lying down on, on the earth, right? Where am I? So that's a little bit, that's a little esoteric there. So, you know, the real use of the body is taught, you know, stand up this way, sit down this way. And many of the movements that we teach in the beginning are not for Westerners at all familiar. These are things like we don't do this, right? And, you know, so you have to adapt to them. You have to learn them. You have to figure out, okay, this wasn't made for me. And I don't live in a world where this is how everybody moves and how many environments are set up to support it. Like how many of us have a tatami room at home? Not so many, right? Um, we do, and so we don't ordinarily, you know, sit in seiza on the floor unless we meditate. We might sit in the cross-legged position or we might sit in seiza or on a seiza bench or something like that. So we might, we might have a practice, an adjacent practice, where we do some of the physical movements of the eye, or we might not. The, so people have to get used to this, and they have to come to trust their body can do it. And some people, you know, usually younger people, but not always, are very athletic. They're very quick. They got good pickup. And you just show them something and they do it. And you're like, great, that's wonderful. I'm such a good teacher, right? And you try to teach the same thing to someone who's not so quick. And you're like, ah, ah, ah. That's right. <laughs> but both kinds of students are really important because they, our students show us what, what people need, right? And, then, and a good teacher, I think, struggles and hopefully at least sometimes succeeds in finding a way to convey what this particular person needs. Yeah. Now, obviously this is very, um, you can't teach a hundred people if you're going to teach them with what they need. Right? And, and even sometimes in the size of classes we're having now, I feel like I can't teach as individually as I'd like to. And just a lot of people, people love EI apparently. That's very cool. And uh, coming out of the isolation of the pandemic, they like, everybody loves to be in the dojo. Very cool. Right? And it's my job to make sure that they still get the right kind of experience, the, the right kind of enough individual situated in a group. 
I think when I first started EI, I thought it was only individual. It was only me. I would just go to practice and do what I did and really enjoy it and go home. And I didn't have much sense of outside of me in the dojo. I mean, I knew other people were practicing along with me, but I didn't have the feeling of we're in a group. And I've come over time to, to realize that we need both the individual thing, but, and sort of the katas provide us with that. If you don't do that, then the rest of it doesn't hang together very well. You're, you know, you're just spending too much time socializing. You're not actually practicing. But then that is also in a larger group, right? And a few things we do are specifically more groupy, where we do like, okay, take you, you three people or you five people and show us these kata and stay together, right? Or let's all do a thousand saburi together, right? That's a group activity. And it's the first time you experience how the group holds you up through something that you would not quite have thought you could do is I think pretty powerful for people. So these are all, these are all body things. And they're, they're both your own body, your own sensations, you know, your feet on the floor, and also uh, people on either side of you or in front of you or behind you, their feet on the same floor, trying, everybody's trying to learn the same things, both specific same things, you know, like this kata, cut this way, you know, relax your hands here, and then squeeze here. And also the individual things, and also the we're together things. Um, they're, and they're not like one and then the next and then the next. They're all, they're all happening together. It's not quite soup, but maybe like a, like a marble cake. That, like, it's an image. No, but it's a good description of like yesterday's practice, for example. Mm. Right. Yeah. That's yeah, that's that's great. You, so you're speaking about uh, individual body, but also collective body, which can elevate you in. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. And I also like this, which which you say it's a very practical and uh, with something which I also came up with lately. Just go ground yourself in the feet. How do you ground yourself? It's like yeah, mm -hmm. you ask, where, where are you? And it's it's like, uh, where are you if you bring your your awareness or bring your uh, attention to the feet to the feet you are automatically going down you're not you get out of your head right you, you come out of your head and you you come out of the, the isolation in your head yeah um, as well as you come into your body and yeah. then you come to your connection like okay yes yeah. this floor is for me and it's for everybody yeah right and it's for itself the floor is here. And it holds up the walls, which hold up the ceiling. The floor is for me to, to stand on or sit on and for everybody else to stand on and sit on. And, you know, 50 years from now, unless the building's been taken down, somebody else will be here doing this. And somebody else will get the chance to do what I did. Great. Yeah. Love that. I, I love who is like, you have to first center yourself to be able to connect from a place of like, of a healthy place, like to be centered. Where am I? Who am I? And then connect with the others in a nice mm -hmm. way of that. Right. Because right. we usually do the opposite. Yeah. I think we often do. And I think especially women often do. Women are, are more, we're all in, in Western society, we're all trained to look out for other people um, and take care of them. And, you know, possibly also look out for them and make sure that they don't do anything to us right? either way. And to like value my feet on the floor and my center over my feet is it's a step forward and sometimes it's not so easy to take right because it can feel selfish it can feel like oh you know i should be watching out for other people and make sure that everybody has enough room and you know i'll just you know minimize myself but the fact is everybody should have the same value in the dojo and you get more out of it if you can value yourself a little bit right? not not so much like I have more value than you. No, I have more. I have the value that I need for me to have. And that's a, you know, that's moving a little bit into the more spiritual um, or something. Right? Human. But, but that for me, yeah, it's, it's funny. Like people say like, why are you doing swords? It's so masculine. I'm like, it's so human, right? Mm. It's so beautiful because as you say, it's about finding myself. Self-exploration is not male or female. You know, it's really, about, and as you say, like, 
we're humans living a life. We need to know who we are. And that's the purpose mm -hmm. of here. And yeah. A little bit Although I, I have to say that I think it's probably easier to think that sword, sword personship is neither male nor female if you have a nice mix of yeah. male and female persons. If the entire top third of your dojo is only men and all the women are down near the beginning, you might say, hmm, what's that? You know, in our dojo, we have higher ranked women. So that that helps. Um, I think it, it makes a difference to the to a little bit difference to what people see, what they think is possible. Um, you know, we have we know that if you can see somebody like you and you can the what the like is is up to you then that that calls you forward in a way that you might not uh, if you couldn't see anybody like you right yeah absolutely if i had visited and you were not there and a couple of women were not there i would not have joined i would have been like too scared mm -hmm. but once you're there it's wonderful <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So I think Anya and I, we wanted to move a little bit for the energy side. I don't know if we covered that a little bit, or if we want to push it a tiny bit. How do you feel about that, Anya? Well, I actually kind of maybe quickly wanted to tackle upon the uh, the body and, and aging. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful topic, which we also mentioned before. Like how, how, how is, yeah, how's your perception changed? Maybe just in short? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I've been practicing for close to 40 years, not quite 40 years, and I'm now 70. Um, and, you know, there are things that I cannot do that I could do 20 years ago. Um, and there are things that I can do that I couldn't do 20 years ago. Some of the things that I can do are have to do with understanding, with um, managing groups, with things like that. And other things that I can't do are just like, okay, this is really hard for me to stand up. Um, it's really hard for me to get into or out of this posture. And what am I going to do about it? Well, luckily, I have good students. And I say, here, show people this. And now, and then I explain what they're supposed to be seeing. The, the, I wouldn't, you know, in some way, I would love to be 50 again. Because that would, you know, but I can't be 50 with, with what I know, right? When I was 50, I didn't know a bunch of things that I know now. And I didn't have certain kinds of confidence. So I just, so my body is doing whatever it's doing. And I'm just going to have to deal with it and not, not deny the changes, not, um, uh, what do I want to say? Not uh, give in to the changes in the sense of, oh, I can't do this, right? It's more like I want to keep the attitude of, oh, well, this is much harder than it used to be, right? I need to understand it, try to figure out ways, try to maintain myself so I can do as much as I can do, and try to value the fact that every practice, every year, the soaking of my being with the practice increases so that if part of what we do when we practice is allow ourselves to be changed to be that different person we want to be that better person we want to be then every time every year I get to live I get to be closer to that person or I get to be farther along in my path I don't really know where I'm going but on the path I get to go further and that's, you know, you, you could think of, well, I have to pay for that with my body. Or you can think, oh, I have to imbue my body with that. I have to get soaked in that and be, you know, be that. Um, that's, you know, I, I, I don't think that I'm avoiding the fact that, you know, you get older, things get hard. Certain things get hard. Some things get easier, actually. There's, there's a ways in which, like, okay. I can't do it anymore. I'm not going to beat myself up. It's gone, right? So for instance, I don't have an ACL in my right knee. It's gone. It broke and it resorbed itself and it's gone. And this is part of why certain things are difficult. It's gone. Not going to get a new one. Okay. 
aside from making that face and a little hand gesture, I don't know how to describe my response to it's gone. It's just it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that is wisdom. So we may lose a little bit of body, but we gain wisdom if we embrace that change, as you said, right? If we don't fight it. And don't pretend it's not happening, right? Yeah. Try to, I want to try to be realistic with myself, also with my students. So I have students uh, all the way, actually I have at least one student still who's older than me. Um, and I have students from, you know, early 20s, uh, all the way up to, you know, early 60s. So you can, I can, and some of them are people I've been teaching for 10 or 20 years. So I see them, that it's, changes in them too. I see all their improvements, all their increase in understanding, they get new swords, all kinds of good stuff, right? But also they go through the same, you know, the same arc of like, oh, right, this is really hard now. Ah, you know, oh, I had to, I, I went and got a, I got an operation for this, trying to fix it. It's better, but you know, it's still not right. Or it's better, but it still hurts. Uh, those, those kinds of things do come up for, for lots of us. No. Yeah, exactly. And that's a perfect transition from the body to energy and mind. When the body steps back, what comes mm -hmm. what jumps in? Yeah. What do you get room for? And I was like really intrigued by how you were speaking about Kiai. And Kiai is already difficult enough to produce the sound. And how do you express the Kiai without the sound? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you could talk about this. This just just to bring to express whatever it is in you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the, because I, because I also practice uh, one of the arts that does ki, I think I have a slightly dis different perspective than somebody who never did. And also I used to do um, Taekwondo where we did ki. And I remember learning how to ki and how hard it was um, to get a, a voice I remember experimenting with different noises and different face shapes and all this stuff, attempting to get something that would, you know, do what I could understand Kiai was supposed to do. Um, and then the, the, for me, the, the Kiai is like the way to connect your center to anything else, whether it's the sword, your, your arms and legs, um, the room, your opponent, it's, the way to bring up <clears throat> out of your center that power, to bring it up and make it connect. Um, so I think sometimes people don't think of ki as something they connect with. They think of it as just a weapon mm -hmm. or just an expression. But I think it's really has to be connecting. And for me, it's connecting my center with my arms and legs, my center with my sword, my center with the, the space, and my center with whatever else is in the space. And that's a lot of work for one thing to do, but since it's key, it's fine. Key can do this, right? If I can hook into it, if I can call it up, if I can um, deploy it, if I can ask it to help me, um, one of the things that I've been, I think this is combination, you know, COVID lockdown, never seeing anybody and being 70. I don't know if that's quite old yet or just older or we're all older um, unless we're dead. So, you know, maybe I'm old, but I think that there's a, there's a thing that I've over the past couple of years that started to happen where instead of always thinking I have to do this, I'm starting to realize that there's things that are going to happen and I should cooperate with them. And there are things that there is energy. I need to, I don't need to just go grab it. I need to cultivate it. I need to let it come to me. I need to let it do what it's going to do if I cultivate it properly and not, not force it, not always be the boss, but be one, one of the, elements that makes a whole and the key i right is if it starts from your center then like okay if i'm the center of the universe which i remember reading about for aikido i, I never could experience it in, in aikido myself but i remember it's like you're the center of the universe so if i'm the center of the universe then the center of me 
is also the center of the universe, even more than me, because that's the real center of, of the universe, then if I'm the center of the universe, then I need to be connected to everything else in the universe. And I need to perceive or cultivate or exercise that connection. You know, just being the center of the universe is like, nah, who cares about that? What can you do when you're the center of the universe? You can call on the universe to help you. You can call on the universe to hold you up and feed you and let you go. Yeah. I was also struggling with this, uh, this being the center of the universe, but then I read another sentence, rephrased, I think, which said, wherever you are, there is the center of the universe, which helped me a little bit more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. right. Wherever I go, I carry it with the potential. So this potential, yeah, learning to access right. that potential. Yeah, great, perfect. Oh. Wow. And I love the combination of center and interconnection, not self-centered, but like using that centering for connecting and supporting and allowing other things to happen, you know, versus, mm -hmm. oh, I'm the center. You know, <laughs> being able yes, to well, do that. Yeah. yeah. And to, to have that, that feeling that it's sort of a, it's sort of an image. It's sort of an understanding. It's, it's a, to me, I, I, I feel this real, visceral sense of placement and I'm placed in a real environment, right? Like there's a real floor and I'm connected to it. It's not that, you know, I have this idea of, of a center kind of floating around somewhere. No, it's right here and it's right now. And that I think is one of the gifts of EI that, that right here, right now, that that's, and, you know, everything else is everything else and before and after and all around you. And, but, but right here, right now, this is what, this is what I am. This is what I'm doing. And th that's a very strong experience when you start to have it, I think. And to be able to give yourself to it, to dedicate yourself to, to it is very powerful. It's, I, I love that because at the end, that's what connects. For example, sometimes I always say Reiki and EI are very connected and being fully present without distraction is the goal of Reiki. But because mm -hmm. it's not, there is no body movement, it's sometimes very hard. And for me, that gift, like EI is giving me that and that kick and Daichi for me is really the gateway to that full presence that you're describing, which mm -hmm. again, compared to my experience, I experienced probably two seconds out of two hours of struggling with my knees and my hands. But it's such beautiful two seconds to have. It's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the that that unity, and you know, it's not something automatic. It's it's you have to work for it. I have to work for it. I. It's not like I just go in the dojo and it happens. You know, I have to practice. I have to focus my mind properly, and I have to continue to cultivate the things that support it. And you know, and then some days it comes. Some days, nah. I can't find it. It's just like it's sleeping or I'm sleeping or somebody's not, you know, somebody's not connecting here. But, but I do think the whole idea of the connection is that for me is, you know, that's something that I've been cultivating and trying to explore and trying to learn and trying to make for at least 10 years, maybe longer. And it's only coming into a clearer understanding now and I think a little bit of that is that time where I just basically couldn't do much except by myself um, from the COVID and also from getting to be 70 um, that this is you know there's it's possible to, to actually learn stuff still right? great yeah great I think we actually already covered the key part of heaven <laughs> Yeah. But I think I would like to close with that question that we have and yeah. what do we cut with, right? In the eye, mm -hmm. cuts are very important. And what do we cut it with and maybe how it changes as well, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, like I said, in the beginning, people are focused out there on their hands and the sword. And they, right? And so they're cutting with their hands. Maybe they're cutting with the sword, but probably not. Probably they're cutting with their hands. And then later on, we get a better sense of cutting with our body. How should my body be placed? You know, how should my balance be? You know, how much muscular effort do I need to put in? How much, 
just, just use your posture muscles and stand up and don't be, you know, don't do anything you don't have to do. Um, so then we're, we're a little closer to cutting with our body. But I think in the end or in the future, we want to cut with our heart or with our guts or both of them. We don't, we do need our body. If you don't have a body, it's really hard. Okay? <laughs> um, if you don't have a sword, it's still possible, but it's easier if you have a sword um, to cut with your whole being. That's really what I think we want to do. We want to cut with our whole being and the ability to focus and dedicate. That's what we practice when we practice. We practice focusing. We practice not being distracted. We, we practice being, getting clearer and clearer and clearer on what we're doing and removing extraneous movement or things that change, make it harder. We're just getting, getting, throwing away things that we don't need and realizing that we don't need them. I think there are many things that we accumulate over our, over our life sometimes in response to other things. And sometimes we just, as I, I think I mentioned this yesterday, we all love to embroider. We all love to add filigree and stuff, right? And, and EI is, it has a specific aesthetic of don't do anything you don't need to do. And this means standing naked in front of yourself. That's what it means. And that's really hard, but you can teach yourself how to do it. And so that when you are without anything, you are right there, right now. Which is Ki Kentai Ichi. <laughs> which is Ki Kentai Ichi, yes. Where the Ki, which, you know, in its smallest uh, understanding is our breath. Bigger is us, our connection to the outside. And the biggest connection, the biggest version of Ki is the energy of the universe, mm. right? That's the one where... Every one of us is the center of the universe, right? And the energy is everywhere, right? That's that stuff. Then there's this external object, the sword. And then there's us, the body, which happens to come with the mind most of the time, right? We want to use all of those to make one large thing, one emotion event, one be here. At a certain point, it's it really hard to describe beyond be right here, just do this. And, and I'm not, it's, this is the same way I have the same struggle to describe it to myself, you know, not just externalized, not just saying it out loud, but like when I was practicing for my seventh on test, I went through a long period of practicing where I kept asking, what am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? And sometimes I would get an answer of, oh, well, I'm trying to do this. That was always, I'm trying to. Right. And that the true answer that I got was I'm doing this. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Speechless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Sensei, there are no words to express the gratitude for all that you're sharing. It's it's very clear. I know you're saying like you don't express it clear to yourself, but it's coming across so clear and so mm. inspiring as well, because I think a lot of us, when we start in the eye, we're so worried about placing our feet or feeling where our feet are. And obviously we're not gonna feel this, but it's nice to know what is the ultimate goal, right? Because it does, it's easier to follow a path when you know where you're supposed to reach. Mm. And then you, instead of like taking the path like this, you're probably gonna have, you know, clear destination. So I really appreciate very much you sharing this time because there are things that sometimes at the dojo we actually don't talk because we're practicing, right? Right. So I, I really appreciate that. Anya, I don't know if there are questions on the live thing. Sometimes people no, have no, no, were, no, I didn't see That's any because. questions coming. So uh, <laughs> anyway, people are welcome to ask still the questions whenever they watch it. Maybe they watch it again or they didn't have questions yet, but they will uh, come up. So please uh, ask mm. the questions. I just wanted to add that uh, for me, it's also it, what you said is indeed is very clear. And thank you for comparison to uh, also Aikido and things uh, to make it more clear. Great. And the kick, when we practice kick and tai ichi, we do it, of course, on the mat. You do it with mm -hmm. a sword. We do it sometimes with a sword, sometimes with a technique. But it's all 
uh, like you said, uh, the expression of the, the to be whole, you can take it with into life. That's that's what's important for me. And I think this is what we practice. We can take it with. It's not it's mm -hmm. not that they are in a dojo. We can bring it with. And this is for me why we practice. Yeah, I, I think so. And that centeredness that, you know, sort of visceral knowing who you are, mm -hmm. then that if it, that goes with you, that's in you. Yeah. So if you're out the dojo, you're in the dojo, you're, you know, at dinner, you're in church, you're wherever you are, um, you're still there. That's you. You're still centered in that way. And you have that strength and that awareness. You can just, you know, use it to, to be there, wherever there is. And especially to not have those things which we do not need. <laughs> like yes. worry about it. <laughs> which is sometimes those those things we don't need are sometimes objects yeah. and sometimes their movements and sometimes their attitudes mm -hmm. right or opinions but more attitudes i think like mm -hmm. you don't actually need you you discover for yourself that oh i don't need that i can i can i can be here and i can go from here to there without without the help of that i don't need that perfect yes yeah. and again that's you know letting things go and it can be can be scary but it's it's how your strength is born you know like the the shell of of the the object or the movement or the attitude that you don't need that that's a shell it breaks open and you go forward new ish <laughs> But it's, no, it's true, like it's because that's the real strength at the end, right? We add all those shells to feel strong, but we're actually not. So really that liberation, it's, it's quite interesting as well. And mm. being Buddhist, yeah, it is a hard, hard work. So it's nice to have a practice that helps you support being able to let go of all of that. Right, where we have the experience of, oh, yeah. right, if I don't do that, things will be better. We have that experience in the dojo, whether we're an Aikido or <laughs> EI or... Jodo or whatever we're practicing, we have that experience of getting rid of something that's getting in our way and succeeding, succeeding mm -hmm. both in getting rid of it and in the thing that we were trying to do that it was interfering with. Mm -hmm. So we get two successes, you know, with this shedding of things that we don't actually need. We thought we needed them. And maybe at some point in the past, we did need them. But part of our, our process in Budo is to work out only what we need and not be carrying around other things right mm -hmm. it's like if you're not a turtle you don't need a shell on your back <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I never put it like that but i'm still in that expression because most of us in new york are like huge turtles carrying many layers of shells and it's heavy mm -hmm. You know, and it's, 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 heavy. it's heavy. Like when you're 20, you can carry your shell. When I'm close to 50, like that shell was too heavy. I'm like, okay, I'm, you know, we need to start shedding that shell. We don't have the strength to carry it. Mm -hmm. So that is a beautiful metaphor. Indeed. <laughs> to finish up with, I think also. <laughs> yeah. It's always okay. hard to finish these things. I always want to keep on talking and chatting. It's yeah. so... Mm -hmm. Thank you so much to both. And, and again, any questions, you can add them to the Facebook Live. And we will also be sharing this interview open like in a week or two to everyone else. And again, Sensei, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both. This was, this was wonderful to prepare for and wonderful to do. Um, I really feel well connected to you. And uh, even though you're in Holland, I feel connected over, over the internet, over the ocean. <laughs> Actually, the internet is under the ocean on the wires, but still, right? I, I, I feel like our conversation, our conversational rhythm is very, you know, nice and sticky. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me and for doing it. Thank you so much for coming and all your wisdom. Indeed. Thank you so much. <laughs> Perfect. So happy sunday to all yes and sensei i'll see you wednesday and anya i'll see you on zoom very soon we have a zoom connection as well yeah <laughs> thank you everybody okay. and bye-bye have a good thank you day. bye mm -hmm.